All right, good morning. Um, so I'm going to talk about Chiari malformations in children. Um, and as Dr. Vez alluded to earlier in his talk, it, it is a little bit different um, because not all kids are speaking, and so they won't come out right, and you can't ask them their symptoms that are going on. So um, we'll, we'll get to some of that um, ahead and some of the challenges in essentially figuring out if they're symptomatic or not or if they um, uh, or even a workup for a child uh, or a baby, frankly. So this is St. Christopher's Hospital. This is my uh, partner there, Dr. Loven. Uh, this is just down the road here in Philadelphia. So where does the name come from? I was just going to go through some of the basics of Chiari, some of the different ways of classifying it, and then really kind of hone in on the symptoms that are a little bit different in children. So um, Hans Chiari, whoops. Hans Chiari was the person who originally described it. This is back in 1891. So this is uh, a long-standing um, uh, name now. And then there was another uh, pathologist who also um, uh, described it several years later. And his name was um, Julius Arnold. So sometimes you'll see on the internet Arnold Chiari uh, as sort of an arnold Chiari name rather than just Chiari malformations. And so he did autopsies on babies who had died from having big heads, hydrocephalus. And then um, that's where he noted that there was this, uh, this light died now too. So the, um, where there's this uh, tonsil herniation, or this sag, if you will, at the base of the brain, and I'll show you some pictures. Um, and then uh, Julius Arnold described that several years later uh, as well. So what are the cerebellar tonsils? So this is looking at the back of the head. This is the cerebellum, and, and here it is looking at it from the very bottom, uh, looking straight up. So this is the spinal cord here. These are the two uh, lobes of the cerebellum. There's a central part here. It's called the vermis, or the worm. Uh, and then you have the tonsils, which are these two little kind of appendages hanging off on the side. And this is what we've all been talking about with this tonsillar herniation. So here's the first bone of the spine. It's C1. This is looking from the back. Here's the second bone of the spine. This is C2. This is where the spinal cord lives. Uh, and here's the opening at the base of the skull. I had some nice pictures in the last talk. Um, it's called the foramen magnum, or the big opening. Uh, and so the um, tonsils, is, there's no real known function with the tonsils, which is where we talk about sometimes in surgery, shrinking up the tonsils. You actually don't see any clinical effect from that. Um, and they're, they're located on the undersurface here. So this is how they manage to kind of creep through the foramen magnum and come out. And, um, and normally these things are supposed to be located above the foramen magnum, just like here. And so in the Chiari, it comes down. So this is the um, flow of spinal fluid. The ventricles are here, so the fluid space is in the center part of the brain, and the spinal fluid circulates all the way around and then down into the spinal canal. Uh, and here's the back portion. Um, this is the view that we had. So here's the cerebellum, and this is a big space where there's supposed to be a lot of spinal fluid. It's called the cisterna magna, or the, or the large basin uh, in Latin. And so here's an opening where there's communications from the outside surface of the brain to sort of the inner surface, the fluid spaces inside of the brain, and then down into the spinal cord. And so here's a picture of, of a Chiari malformation where that space in the last picture, it was um, large and blue, full of fluid, full of spinal fluid, is gone because there's tissue hanging out in that space. And what does that space do? It essentially buffers our neck movement. So the brain and spinal cord are floating in the spinal fluid and they kind of bounce around a little bit and you have a nice cushion there. And so then you lose that cushion and then that's where all the sort of mayhem starts. So the, some of this stuff is just kind of simple data. The prevalence, it's, it's relatively rare overall. Um, and uh, this is just from some studies in 2011, the percentage in children. And again, this is based on that five millimeters measurement off of an MRI, which we'll show you here. And, and really, there's, there's, this hasn't been shown to have any kind of a um, gender predilection. But there is some association in people with, uh, in their families. And I have a few patients whose um, three generations have Chiaris and a couple with two generations. Um, and multiple surgeries in them as well. So there's different types of Chiari classification, or I should say types, um, anywhere from zero to four. Oh, and so we'll just go through some real quick uh, looks at those. So this is a type, uh, this is the type one. This is the, the more common one that you'll see in adults because it's not really associated with other findings, if you will, in the spinal axis or the neuro axis. So basically the brain and spinal cord column. Uh, and so this is where you have this 
portion of the cerebellum coming down into the foramen magnum, uh, just as you have it here. This one also has a syrinx, as Dr. Bez had talked about earlier, and about 50% of these Chiaris uh, have the finding of a syrinx. This is a type 2, so this is kind of, this is, I put here associated with the myelomeningocele, and kind of the way I sometimes remember it is that there's an opening down at the bottom end in the spine, and so things kind of go downwards. And so you have everything kind of sagging down through this opening, uh, and then there's, you know, parts of the neural tissues hanging out of the lower back. This is when babies are first born and, all, and usually need a repair. Uh, and so here you can see everything sort of gets crowded down, and it descends below the, the uh, second spinal um, bone, so C2 here. And then this is another, you know, mo even more rare um, uh, variant of it, a Chiari 3, where you have an opening, a sac outside of the skull um, underneath the skin, where you have tissue protruding into it. This is spinal fluid in, in this thing that's called a meningocele. Uh, and here's some more tissue herniating into that sac. Um, and so this is quite rare. Uh, and then this is a Chiari type 4 where you just have underdevelopment of the um, tissue of the cerebellum, that back part of the brain. Uh, and you can see there's not really much here. Uh, and this is the original picture in the, from the paper in 1895 when they first described this from studies. And so you can see that the, the look of the cerebellum, is just it's not a normal look to it. Or you'll just have to take my word for it, I suppose. So um, these are a couple newer descriptions of Chiari, some variants, and this is really for kind of surgeons to be able to communicate with each other and, and knowing what type of a Chiari we're addressing to come up with solutions for the right thing. And so there's a Chiari Zero, which has just a small space in the back, because at the end of the day, this is really kind of a real estate problem if you think about it, real estate and space that everybody's fighting for. And so you have a small space in the back, and then you have this um, portion of the cerebellar tonsil coming down, and it doesn't always necessarily have a syrinx with it. And then you have this Chiari, or 1.5 is what people have, have <laughs> called it, where things are hanging down. And really, it's the fact that the brain stem, so the lowest part of the back part of the brain, where what I'll talk about um, is the cranial nerves. These are the nerves going out to the face and the upper torso that control a lot of the functions. That's where they become symptomatic. And so this is kind of an advanced form of a regular Chiari 1. And the Chiari 1, again, just as a review, was where sort of the bottom of the brainstem was here. The cerebellar tonsil was coming below where it usually lives. And now in this 1.5, you have the bottom part of the brainstem hanging low too. And then they have this syrinx with it as well. And then you have a complex Chiari. I think there's a whole talk about this um, coming up, so I won't go into it in, um, uh, too much. But basically what it involves is um, the fact that you have um, a lot going on in this region, not just in the back, but actually up in the front, where you have, this is the uh, top of C2, the second bone in the spinal column. And sometimes it pushes, I have pictures of this um, later in the talk, where it starts pushing into the brainstem, where you have brainstem symptoms. And then you have changes in the shape and the angles of these bones. And um, there's different ways of classifying this, different ways of measuring it, and sort of deciding who needs what kind of a treatment beyond, sometimes uh, beyond just the surgery that we do in a Chiari, which is opening this uh, back portion of those pictures that Dr. Vez had shown. And so these folks, you can have them after some surgeries for a Chiari where things become unstable and folks end up needing a fusion. And this is what, that, this is just a simple picture of uh, screws in C2 with some uh, plates in the bone here in the occipital bone and they're connected with some rods and everything held together so that eventually you'll have a fusion where nothing moves anymore. Uh, because what happens is when there's all this extra movement, that movement keeps pushing into the spinal cord and the brain stem and it just makes, aggravates system, uh, symptoms, excuse me. Okay, so the symptoms, um, and Dr. Vez went through a lot of these, and this is where I'll get into the trickiness in sort of diagnosing this and, and really figuring out whether kids have it or not, because they're not always going to be able to tell you. So this is the, the classic is having a headache in the back of the head, top part of the neck that's worsened with Valsalva maneuvers, <laughs> coughing, sneezing, leaning forward, bearing down. These kind of things really make the headache worse. Oftentimes, um, I've had patients who will wake up in the middle of the night, particularly kids, kind of seven, eight-year-old kids who wake up in the middle of the night screaming um, in pain. And they hold the back part of their head is where it really hurts at the top back part of their head. 
And the reason for that is because when you sleep, your breathing slows down and your brain swells up just because your body's holding on to more carbon dioxide. Uh, and so the brain gets a little bit more full and as that fullness happens, it puts more pressure in the back part there. So these kids are waking up with a much worsened headache to the point that the headache has obviously woken them up and they're screaming, uh, screaming and crying. And then you have you know, neck, shoulder, back pain, this whole upper area. And like Dr. Vez said, it's a deep pain. It's not one that you can push on and reproduce. Um, and then there's these motor sensory changes. And then this is just a fancy word, this bulbomyelopathic. It just means the brain stem, the spinal cord, and something bad going on. And so th those symptoms are, these are the more advanced, the ones you really have to kind of ask about specifically, or at least we physicians have to ask about specifically. And it's sleep apnea, snoring, this dysphagia is problem swallowing, vertigo is when the room spins, um, and nystagmus is abnormal uh, bouncing of the eyes or beating of the eyes, and ataxia is, is just being off balance, off kilter, some people will say. And so these, these symptoms basically here point to the lower part of the brain, the brain stem, or the upper part of the spinal cord, which I'll show you in some of the pictures. So some of the things, in, more so in kids, sometimes they'll have what's called toe walking, where they're walking on their tiptoes, and their, their walking isn't, doesn't look like a normal baby's or a normal toddler's. And oftentimes that's, and this is a whole other talk too that it'll, somebody else will give, on tethered cord syndrome, but sometimes you can have that in kids with the Chiari, and sometimes the kids have also a tethered cord. What a tethered cord is that the spinal cord is literally tethered. It's pulled lower than it normally lives in the bottom part of the spine. And we also do procedures where we do a detethering of the spinal cord too. And so sometimes you can have a situation where if you can imagine the spinal cord is being pulled from below and it pulls the spinal cord and lower part of the brain down so that if you detether it, at least it kind of releases some of that. But um, that's a separate issue. And then this lower cranial nerve, again, these are the nerves that go out to the face, to the swallowing muscles in the throat, to the upper torso. And these are the ones that are causing, um, when they have problems or if they're poorly developed because of the Chiari, the, what's called the nuclei or the control centers of these nerves aren't functioning normally. And that's where people end up having issues with sleep apnea or problems swallowing, dysphagia. And then, <clears throat> and then there's the atypical symptoms the stuff that kind of isn't necessarily in textbooks but that you end up seeing and then sometimes after you take care of a patient with you know doing let's say it, i've had a few kids they've had the regular the classic chiari symptoms you do the chiari surgery for those symptoms and you find that a lot of other things has changed in them uh, and so i'll mention some of those a little bit later too so in in teenagers and young adults who you know don't have any reason to have hypertension. Kids you're seeing who are on a couple of antihypertensive medications where it just doesn't make sense. Teenagers shouldn't have that. Um, or some pro other problems with their autonomic nervous system, their heart rate, this kinds of stuff. Um, you find that after you do a Chiari decompression that this tends to resolve. Um, and so that's again related to the brainstem portion of the um, uh, brain and those nuclei that are there. So this is a, a pretty good quote from a paper in that, you know, not all symptoms are typical and the atypical ones are the harder ones to predict how they'll go. Um, but if you have a whole constellation, a whole group of typical symptoms, and then you have some of these atypical ones, at least you know you can do a surgery and help the typical symptoms. And then very often you'll see that the atypical symptoms improve too, which is great. Um, and then there's this, uh, so this is in, in kids, even in, in younger, small kids, little babies, toddlers. Um, the, the fancy term is this oral motor apraxia. So they're just, these movements become slower. So they are not speaking at the time that they're supposed to, uh, reaching their milestones at that certain age they're supposed to be speaking. And likewise, they're not feeding as well because sometimes they're having swallowing problems. And um, you know, here in preverbal, so these kids who aren't speaking, it's really the delay in milestones. They're not walking at the age they're supposed to, they're not sitting up when they're supposed to, or at least maintaining uh, an upright posture when they're sitting up. Uh, and so that's very often, you know, pediatricians will refer these kids, babies, to see a neurologist, a pediatric neurologist, and, and often a pediatric neurologist will observe them for a month or two months and see if there's any improvement, any change. And then if they note that there's no change, that's often when they'll start getting scans, CAT scans, MRIs, et cetera. 
Um, and again, here, then there's things like reflux, and then the kids just aren't swallowing well, they're not eating well, they won't gain weight uh, on, along the curves that they're supposed to, um, that all kind of are mapped out for kids. And then the other thing that's, that's actually quite common in children is as scoliosis, progressive scoliosis, not being common, I mean is a common finding in kids who have a Chiari. Uh, and scoliosis is that S-shaped curvature of the spine. And what will happen in these kids is that they will have some mild curve and as they start getting older and growing, the curve will worsen, it will become more severe. And so in those folks, their physicians will get um, you know, make a referral to a spine surgeon, for example, and a spine surgeon who's, you know, does this day in and day out will know that a child whose curve is worsening or is going in a direction that is less common uh, will get appropriate imaging to look at the nerves in the spinal cord, the brain in the spinal cord, and they'll find a Chiari. And so I'll show you um, a slide of that. So the studies that are done, now MRI is quite common, um, but very often you start with a CAT scan because it's fast. Um, and particularly in kids, an MRI is, is not an easy thing to obtain because to have a nice MRI, you want um, no movement. Uh, and all of these um, MRIs that were previously so shown, particularly the ones that have, that were showing you the flow across these spaces, the flow of the spinal fluid, it's heart rate dependent and babies have really high heart rates and so sometimes these MRIs aren't picking up on that flow because the heart rate is so high uh, and so that's affected. Then the other thing is that you don't want movement. Movement really affects the quality of the imaging in an MRI. So children or babies or toddlers, even very young adolescents um, who have learning impairments or developmental issues if you want a good MRI, oftentimes they'll have to be sedated or just have general anesthesia. So, you know, really, that's just why you can imagine why sometimes there's a delay in diagnosing children because people are hesitant to put a, a baby or a, or a toddler under general anesthesia to have an imaging study if it potentially is going to come back as being normal. Um, but, um, you know, at children's hospitals, this is a day in, day out kind of thing, so that risk is, is pretty minimal, but it's still a real risk and it's a consideration. Um, and then there's these other studies um, that are done not so commonly, but sometimes they're backwards workups until somebody gets an MRI. So a teenager who's getting, you know, having a lot of snoring problems and then um, is eventually sees some pulmonologist and they get a sleep study and they find that there's an apnea, but it's a central apnea coming from the brainstem. Then eventually they'll get referred to somebody who'll, who'll do the MRI to, to find that they have a Chiari. And so here's this kind of general agreement statement about this five millimeter thing. Even this is debatable. And certainly when it comes to symptoms, it's very, very debatable. Uh, and then this, this um, clival axial thing is about the um, uh, instability and the cranial cervical stuff that'll be in another talk. So the causes, there's not one identifiable cause. One of the large points is that this is not a fixed lesion, but it's a dynamic entity. And, and, it, and the fact that it's a dynamic entity, one of the things is that it's really cumulative, which is why you sort of do a long-term follow-up on these kids and, and adults. Because when you first see them, they don't necessarily have any symptoms. But just as Dr. Vez showed in that MRI, when you have a different appearance when it's sitting versus laying flat, likewise in walking, there's differences with time, as particularly in kids, as they grow taller. Sometimes their spines grow taller than their, nerve, than their uh, spinal cord and brains do, if you will. And so this is where these things will change over the course of time. And so this is where we follow um, uh, with serial imaging, if you will, with uh, MRIs every few months, couple years, this kind of a thing. Um, and then um, some of the culprits for Chiari's is this, um, you know, you can see that it's a real estate problem, this malformed posterior fossa, this, the shape's not right, the space is too small. Um, and then sometimes it can be associated with syndromes where the shape of the skull overall is not the way that it's, it's not normal per se, and so that'll affect the shape in the back. Uh, and then again, the, some genetic link where you, have, you can have it in families. So the treatment, again, debatable uh, in, in who to treat, who not to treat. Um, but uh, in general, if you have a Chiari malformation and no symptoms, then it's an incidental finding and we keep an eye on it. Uh, and actually there was a pretty nice study looking at kids and really only about four to 5% of these kids progressed over several years time 
from having this incidental finding on MRI to becoming symptomatic and even getting to the point of needing a surgery. So it's not necessarily something that needs to be imaged every month, every two months kind of thing. You can space it out. And certainly when symptoms start developing, then to, to look a little bit more closely. Uh, and then the symptomatic ones get treated, and, and that's where surgery will come into play, as Dr. Fez had um, kind of spoken about. And then the types of surgeries, um, I'll show just some images. Um, so the non-surgical patient, so we answered this question about routine repeat imaging, and then a syrinx, a patient with a syrinx, that's that fluid collection in the middle of the spinal cord, they don't necessarily all need surgery. Um, most neurosurgeons uh, in kind of um, survey questionnaires, particularly pediatric neurosurgeons, if somebody does have a syrinx, will recommend a surgery because oftentimes when something becomes very symptomatic from a syrinx, sometimes those symptoms don't uh, reverse completely. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but again, that's debatable too. Um, so the surgical approaches, again, this is just to, to recreate the cisterna magna and create normal flow real estate, you know, you want more land, so you make more land. Um, how you go about doing that is where the variability and the type of operation comes up. Um, the, um, I think there are, I have a couple pictures, they're not terribly bloody. Um, actually, there's not really any blood, they're just kind of pictures from surgery that aren't too bad. So this is looking at the back, here's the bone. This is the dura that's exposed in the back part. So if you can imagine the cerebellum, the two lobes are inside underneath here. Um, here's where the bone used to be at C1, so that bone has been removed. Here's where the bone is visible at C2. And so this is a, a what's called a bone-only Chiari. So the dura has not been opened. Uh, the bone has been removed. That thick band has been opened with some cuts in between it, that ligament. That creates real estate. And then uh, some little hash uh, incisions, you can't see them on this picture, but this is where they kind of marked it out. So hash incisions are made in the layer of the dura. What that'll do is it'll let that dura expand with time. Uh, and, and there's very good results with that uh, uh, in terms of symptomatic relief and even the syrinx getting smaller. So just removing that bone and opening this uh, constricting band creates real estate. This is augmenting the real estate. So this is that same view. What's happened is that the dura was open in this space here and a patch was sewn in. So now you have this, this triangle here is the patch uh, and this is the suture line. And so this is all new real estate that's been placed in there. So you have a big, big spacious area um, for the cerebellum to live in and for you have spinal fluid flow. This is what it looks like. Here's the bony removal. And this is the back part of C1 has been removed, which is why you can see this bone in the front uh, at C2. Normally, you can't see that from that view. And here's what it looks like. You have tight confines and open space. So great result. Um, this, is a, uh, this is one of the complex Chiaris. And so you can see in the back, it, this, here's the bottom of the bone. Here's the tonsil hanging below the bone. And then there's this sharp angulation here to the, of the bone in the front and at the base of the skull. And that bone is pushing into the uh, bottom part of the brain stem. Uh, and so this, is, um, this will be addressed in one of the, the talks coming up. So these are two cases that are not typical cases um, uh, because I figured most of the talks are going to have kind of the standard cases, the QR decompression, uh, nice result from it. So these are complicated cases, and these are the ones that sort of leave a lot of folks wondering, you know, what do we do? What are the steps that we should do? So this is a 17-year-old who has um, osteogenesis imperfecta, and what that is, um, that's a genetic defect where the bones don't harden fully. Uh, and these kids are prone to fractures with simple movements. In fact, this, this young gal um, came in for an outpatient chest x-ray because she was having an ongoing cough. And when they put the, uh, the board underneath her chest to take a chest x-ray, um, she fractured a couple ribs. And, and that's a very gentle movement, and, and that broke her ribs. So it was a very delicate situation. And she has short extremities, but everything moves and everything works, and she's uh, wheelchair bound motorized wheelchair, cognitively fully intact. She's graduated high school. She's going on to college um, um, online uh, since, uh, <coughs> excuse me, since her mobility is relatively limited. She had scoliosis, uh, so the curvature of the spine. That was addressed with the surgery when she was younger, and you can, you can't, whoops, 
you can't really see the, um, the hardware, but she has screws in the middle uh, part of her back. Uh, and so that was done years ago. And then she had a Chiari malformation here, which when she was younger, <coughs> excuse me, she had a bone only decompression and her symptoms improved from that. And this was uh, eight years prior she had that surgery. But you can see on this study, <coughs> I think you can see that there is this tightness here the cerebellum is hanging below where the edge of that bone opening that they had made is located. And she does have an abnormal shape to the back part of her head. <clears throat> you just have to take my word for it on that. And then the other big thing is that she has this searing. So here's <clears throat> spinal fluid in the middle of her spinal cord. And this thin line around the edge, this is her spinal cord really just thinned out from all that, <clears throat> excuse me, from all the fluid that's built up here. So, um, you know, this she's had imaging every six months, <clears throat> every seven months or so. And then she came into the hospital with a facial droop that resolved after a few minutes. So she got another MRI. And every six months, every seven months when she's getting this MRI, you can see this fluid collection was getting bigger. And when she came in for her scan to look for a reason for her having a facial droop, it, they scanned her brain too. And at that point, you know, it's relatively subtle uh, overall. But the fluid spaces, these, these are called the ventricles in her brain, they're a little bit bigger. And so this young gal, um, in having slightly enlarged fluid spaces, no real symptoms from that, yeah, thank you. Um, and the fact that here is tight again, you know, her getting a chest x-ray, causing fractures of her ribs and getting hospitalized for a week because of that, thank you. Um, is a problem, let alone, you know, taking her to, to do the surgery for a Chiari, the positioning, patients have to be flipped onto their bellies and their head has to be tilted in. You know, if she got a chest x-ray and she broke a couple of ribs, can you imagine how much it would break if we had to position her in that situation? So, you know, this is a very realistic talk I had with her, you know, she's fully cognitively intact, and I had with her parents, uh, is that, you know, we have this finding here, things are getting worse, she's obviously becoming more symptomatic, and then when she was in the hospital um, during her rib fracture stay and her pneumonia treatment, they had her connected to a, a CPAP, so a breathing machine at night, and the machine was picking up apnea. So this is not only getting worse on pictures, but it's actually getting more symptomatic and putting pressure on her brainstem. So, you know, we're, we're kind of, we need to do something for this gal because she's getting worse. She's having new symptoms. So that this is where I had a very realistic talk with them about the, the risks of that surgery, just in positioning her. And the fact that she has these bigger fluid spaces here, well, what if we relieve some of that pressure? Will it help this situation? It's, it's a first step that we can take to kind of avoid doing something further here because of the risks entailed in that. So um, they wanted to go through with that. So this is the catheter of a shunt. You can see that the fluid spaces are much smaller <clears throat> compared to here. And so this is what her, um, uh, is that even projecting at all? Um, so the fluid space here has gotten, I guess you'll have to take my word for it, it's gotten much smaller. The fluid space in here has gotten smaller, this ventricle. There's less compression on her, um, the bottom part of her brain stem. And this was after three months that the apnea, the breathing spell, the lack of breathing spells she was having had resolved. And so, even when we did this shunt procedure, we moved her on egg crates from her hospital stretcher to the operating table, and she ended up having a femur fracture that needed surgery. So, you know, tough situation, but after this was done, she was doing much better. And so she's not gone on to need another Chiari decompression. So not your typical case, but it's, it's a solution that, that, that has worked for her and the risks that are entailed in her unique situation. So this is sort of the before and then the after. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that at all. I can barely see it, but that's gotten smaller. So it's good. And the other thing is it's still there, uh, but her symptoms have improved. So, you know, we'll just keep an eye on it and, and keep our fingers crossed. All right, so this is another one. This is an eight-year-old, um, and she has what's called Cruzon syndrome, which is a developmental issue. Um, and this is, she has a scoliosis, and so, you know, a mid, what's called a mid-sagittal cut, looking right down the center, you don't see all of her bones here because then it takes kind of a sharp turn over. And she was being watched uh, with x-rays uh, for her scoliosis, and then it really progressed. 
And um, when they did an MRI, this is a huge searing she had from the very top of her spinal cord all the way down to the bottom. She also had a tethered cord and she also had a Chiari. And so um, when she came to see me, the one thing that she hadn't had done, and I, when I looked up here, I saw that that fluid space looked a little bit big, was a picture of her brain. And when we got a picture of her brain, she had hydrocephalus. So, and she has some fluid shift here too. So she ended up having a shunt done as well. This is the marker from the shunt and the fluid spaces are much smaller. And so here's the difference in her syrinx. Significantly smaller and the Chiari is still there. <clears throat> Excuse me, so this is the before and this is the after. You can actually now see spinal fluid in front and behind of the spinal cord. So we've decompressed her tethered cord, I'm sorry, we detethered her tethered cord as well and so she's, her, her back has straightened up a little bit, her walking has improved, her personality changed after she got the shunt. She's talking, she's playful, she's doing better in school, and so she still is, has this Chiari, so you know she's still symptomatic, so we're gonna decompress this Chiari and then see if she needs to have her scoliosis addressed with the spine straightening surgery. I think that's it.